Station Houston on two. Uh, are you ready for the event? We are ready for the event. ESA, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Uh, Andre and uh, Don, uh, this is uh, ESA International Space Station. Uh, we are ready for the event. Uh, how do you read? Hi, Frank. Good to, uh, to hear your voice. And uh, hello at EAC, everybody. We can hear you loud and clear. And we have a great picture here, uh, Andre uh, and uh, Don. Uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, today. It's wonderful to see you all floating and smiling there in uh, in the space uh, station. Uh, the first question may be from, from my side. Uh, to all these people here in, in ESC that were here and they visited our Columbus uh, module and, and all kinds of things, and a lot of questions in microgravity. Can you demonstrate a little bit to us what it is microgravity? Well, actually, we can, and uh, Don uh, prepared a great experiment, uh, which we will now demonstrate. I mean, this is all for science, so we really do some, some science uh, experiment here. So normally we let some things float, etc., but uh, now we're going to really uh, demonstrate uh, some uh, scientific uh, phenomenon. Okay, we all know that pendulums are a gravity machine and they need gravity to work. And I have an example here of a pendulum where we put a long spring on the end of the pendulum and the spring can replace the effect of gravity. Go ahead, give it a small perturbation. So now this spring is giving a force that is like gravity for small angle displacement. And small angle displacement is where the sine of theta equals theta, and of course that's when theta is measured in radians. And so here, here we have an example where a pendulum, which simply will not work in gravity, you affix a spring to the end of it, and now all of a sudden it will work. And it works according to the pendulum equation where the period is mass independent, and it depends on the length of the pendulum. So that's one demonstration here in a weightless environment. But now, let me change the spring just a little bit and we'll change the behavior of the pendulum. Now the spring, instead of pulling the pendulum uh, along its length, it's, perpen it's perpendicular to the length. And that, okay, hold on. Yep. And it's perpendicular to the length, and that changes the dynamics. It's no longer a pendulum with a pendulum equation. It's now a simple harmonic oscillator. And the, the frequency or the period of vibration is now mass dependent. So, so th this was a simple demonstration. A simple demonstration that shows an apparatus that we're all familiar with on Earth, a pendulum, but it won't work in a weightless environment. You add a spring force to it and it becomes a pendulum again, but then you change the spring angle 90 degrees and all of a sudden it changes its behavior so it's a mass dependent period it becomes a simple harmonic oscillator 
Well, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting uh, uh, demonstration that, that you have given uh, for things that only can work in uh, microgravity. And Zahn, I think you have the next question for Don. Sure. First, can I say that was just so cool. And thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Um, this is uh, Zahan Barmel from the YouTube team. Um, I have a question in two parts. Uh, part one, can you tell us what is the best thing about working on board the International Space Station? And part two, can you give us some uh, idea of what typical research you carry out on board the ISS? Well, the best thing is that uh, if you're normally uh, working in science, uh, then you, you, you're concentrating on one field. The nice thing of being an astronaut is that you do uh, research in all kinds of fields, and that's a, 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 a big variation, uh, which is new, the newest ideas. Uh, so that, that's a nice feeling that you're working. Uh, for example, one day you do a biology experiment, uh, the next day uh, the, there's a combustion experiment done with a lot of combustion experiments, for example. Then you are a subject or an operator for a human physiology experiment. Uh, then there is something with, with, with earth observation or even robotics. Uh, we have been uh, working with, uh, with Robonaut. So, so it's technology, it's life science, it's material science. And that is one of the very nice aspects of being an astronaut, to be in all these different fields. I guess this answers also the, 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 the second part of uh, the question straight away. Hello. Hello, my name is Laura Calvo. Yes, go ahead. And my question is, do plants undergo the same as Do plants undergo the same stress as humans do in space? Uh, plants and humans have significant different physiologies and the environment on space station is designed for humans and so plants don't necessarily do very well in this environment they they are under stress but different kinds of stresses than what human beings have and it's actually quite challenging to raise a plant in a weightless environment as as i've been uh, 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 working on in some of my off-duty time now you can design a complex piece of equipment which inside of the equipment provides the environment that is conducive for plants to grow but if you just want plants to grow as the equivalent of a potted plant in a corner of a room, uh, that's uh, a tough thing to have uh, in a spacecraft. Hello, my name is Maria Villas, and my question is how long could an astronaut stay on the ISS and expect a full health recovery back on Earth? Now that's a very interesting question. Uh, people have been in space for a long time. Uh, a, a Russian doctor, Polyakov, uh, has been uh, in space in, in one go uh, more than a year, and, uh, and he was in good shape when he came back. Uh, we do a lot uh, of effort to stay in shape, so we do sports every day to keep our muscles and bones in a, in a good condition. Now, of course, there is the, there is some deterioration in weightlessness. You still have uh, some muscle atrophy, uh, some bone uh, mineral density density loss, uh, and of course there's the radiation. Now, so far all the astronauts uh, get back into normal shape, although it takes a long time. For example, for the bones, it can take a very long time before your, your bones uh, are back. Uh, the effects of radiation are cumulative, so that is something that you cannot uh, turn back, but this is not different than for people who work in certain areas on the ground uh, involving uh, radiation. So in general, with the help of all the medical people on the ground, and the sports that we do. Uh, also, after flight, uh, we do a lot of uh, uh, things to get back in shape. All the astronauts get back in normal shape after the flight. Hello, my name is Amr Mohammed, and my question is, uh, what do you think about the future of space exploration? I mean, uh, space exploration is very expensive, and uh, with the current economic situations all over the world, I would like to know what's the future of my generation in space exploration. Uh, 
Good question. First off, space exploration compared to what we spend our money on socially in the form of governments is small. It's a, it's a small amount of our social resources that we're currently devoting to space. Now, uh, my generation has forged out the current space program that you see, and of course there was a generation before me that uh, forged their version out, and what the future of space exploration will be for humans and robots is going to depend on you and what your generation decides that you want to do. So one of my favorite quotes is, the best is yet to be. And uh, that we will see with space exploration and it will depend on what you and your generation decides that you want to make out of space exploring. Hello, my name is Marina Lopez, and uh, my question. In microgravity, the human body suffers some changes, but is it now what could happen to a pregnant woman and her baby in the pregnancy at the birth happening in microgravity? Very interesting question, uh, which I cannot give you the answer straight away because uh, we didn't have such a situation, luckily, uh, because uh, this is a strange environment and uh, we can uh, uh, not afford to do some kind of an experiment like this, uh, um, uh, at least uh, uh, with humans. So, because we know from, uh, from lower vertebrate experiments that have been done that there is an effect of gravity on the development of embryos. So this this might be something uh, uh, dangerous, uh, at least at the present time, for uh, for humans to uh, to try out. So this is something that maybe in the far future this might be uh, uh, an issue that is uh, the, that is getting important. But at the moment we don't do this with humans. Although the experiments with animals uh, are very interesting, uh, because like with uh, what we do also with plants, we see it then also in uh, in the animal development that there is an effect of, uh, of gravity uh, on the development of the cells. Now, this is interesting because the baby, the, the embryo itself uh, in, uh, in, in, inside the womb is, is actually floating. So you can compare it a bit uh, with microgravity in that sense. But apparently, even on, uh, on those cells, gravity has an effect. Hi, my name is Luis Alvarez, and I wonder if there has been any discovery made in the ISS in, the, in microgravity conditions, which we use every day in our normal life. The benefits of science and technology uh, come slowly and incrementally. And these are endeavors that you work on over long periods of time, and over these long periods of time, you will see the benefit come out. And this applies to both science and engineering and technology development on Earth, as well as what we see here in space. And I think the, the best thing to say about, about the benefit of exploring space uh, can be from its effect on human beings. To be able to see our planet from a view outside of a planet looking in or looking down and to be able to understand our place in our solar system and maybe even the universe. And I, th I think this is one of the, the most outreaching effects of human beings going into space. And I, I like to, to sum up the purpose or the value of exploration from a T.S. Eliot quote where uh, uh, he uh, paraphrases the value of exploration is to be able to go and when you come back you know you're, you're home for your first time. Great, and thank you very much for all these uh, interesting questions. Han, you have another question, I think, for the crew up there. I have, I have one more question. Um, so one of our goals running Space Lab is to showcase some of the best space and science-related video content on our channel. And so my question for you is, uh, what is your favorite YouTube video? 
Well, that's an interesting one because there are so many uh, in, in all kind of fields. Uh, uh, the funny ones, uh, the, the interesting ones. Uh, there's a lot of nice uh, video tubes from uh, f video films uh, from Don with uh, with all his, uh, his science experiments. I know very well that one of the first that I liked very much was actually uh, something that had to do with nature, which was Battle at Kruger, uh, and uh, that was uh, very interesting, which I uh, watched a lot. But nowadays, uh, the choice is so big that uh, it's it's pretty impossible to uh, to mention a, a special uh, a special film. from uh, this uh, discussion as well. Does anybody in the room has a science-related question? Because it's really YouTube and science, and so anybody has a science-related question? Nobody dares to ask a question to the space station. Come on, guys, it's your chance. Once in, uh, okay, science-related question. Uh, yes, uh, hello, my name is Jaime Costa. And I'd like to ask uh, what can you hear from the ISS, if you can hear something? like some uh, uh, impact maybe on, on some uh, sort of uh, vibrations, I don't know. So yes, a good question related to uh, all the noises that you hear on the uh, ISS. Well, well, inside station, there's a lot of machinery. There are fans and motors and things like that. So you, you hear a lot of machinery kind of noises. But what's really amazing is to go in the Columbus module, and and it, it's best to do this when it's uh, crew sleep time because everything's quiet, the lights are turned out, and you just sort of float in the Columbus module, and you can hear all this groaning and creaking and popping. It sounds like an old wooden sailing ship, maybe maybe what Columbus's ship might have sounded like, and and you hear all this groaning and creaking and popping. And you wonder, what's making all of that noise? Because, uh, of course, we're surrounded by a near vacuum in space, and, and acoustical uh, propagation uh, won't go in a vacuum. So what's making that noise? And uh, Andre and I were talking about that. We're not sure, but we think it's a micrometeorite shielding on the outside of Columbus. It's designed a little differently than the rest of the station. And we think that it's groaning and creaking through thermal stress as it undergoes heating and cooling cycles with day and night. But we're not sure about that. Don and Andre, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting uh, video conference live from space. I think uh, everybody here was excited to see you, was excited to listen to your answers to the interesting question. Can I hear a big cheer from the audience for Don and Andre? Okay, that was great. Thank you very much. And it was a pleasure. Good luck with all the science. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. We are now returning to our normal calm.